And we're back with The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa for our first conversation where the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has once again stressed the need for Africa's giant to put an end to energy subsidy, even as it called for the country to increase her revenue base by focusing on increasing its tax bracket and compliance rather than engage in more borrowings. Now, presently, the current, uh, the country's debt profile is in excess of a... Uh, 42 trillion naira with the government planning to borrow more just to meet the needs of the 2023 budget and its obligation. The Nigerian's public debt profile had risen uh, so much under the president of Mohamed Buhari's administration when compared to the previous government since 1999. And foreign debt also grew three times more than the combined figures recorded by the past three administrations. It's also reported that, you know, domestic debt as well as foreign debt uh, showed so much. But j just interesting is the fact that when uh, President Olusha Gunobasanjo was president at the time, uh, there were concerns of $28 billion as foreign debt. That was what we're looking at in 1999. And when he was leaving, he left 2.11 billion naira, uh, I beg your pardon, billion dollars in 2007 after successfully securing a write-off by the London and Paris Club of Foreign Creditors. That was when we talked about, oh, debt cancellation. Nigerians were very happy. Then the Yaradu and Jonathan government added 1.39 billion what they met. And then Jonathan government incurred additional 3.8 billion naira, taking the country's total foreign debt to about 7.3 billion uh, when that administration came to an end in uh, 2015. But Nigeria's external loan reached $28.57 billion by December 2020, meaning that an extra $21.27 billion had been accumulated on the uh, President Mohamed Buhari administration, three times the combined amount. And uh, if you want to go through you know, the consents or uh, the debt profile, if time will let us. I'm sure that in the course of this conversation, we'll just run through all of that uh, where we are. But we'll just leave it at that because we have a guest who's joined us this morning, a financial analyst in Lagos, Mukta Mohammed. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, please. I I'd like you to speak to, you know, the suggestions and thoughts from the IMF asking that Nigeria should uh, consider the you know, stoppage of energy subsidies and also uh, consider expanding her tax bracket and ensuring compliance rather than uh, you know, borrowing? Well, I can't but agree with them in one um, area. I think uh, um, in the area of um, subsidy payment, I think it's high time Nigerian stops that wastage in the area of subsidy payment. Uh, then if you talk about tightening the, the tax bracket, we keep saying tightening the widening the tax bracket, widening the tax bracket. But what we see the government do is, uh, most time what the government do is to um, 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 uh, um, um, put more burden on the already burden that are paying taxes. It don't seem um, to widen the tax bracket because if you talk about widening the tax bracket, a report came out last week how, how the OICs, I see owing us um, millions of dollars and accumulated trillions of naira. That is about six trillion. That is, or is 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 okay to even fund our deficit, our budget deficits. So, in terms of widening our tax bracket, I think we should begin to look at the OICs. That is the internet, the organization of international companies that are in Nigeria. We need to begin to look at them whether they really pay the real tax to us. For me, that's where I think the widening should come from. Because when you talk about widening the tax bracket with other Nigerians, and they're already highly burdened, and uh, another thing I would say, if you're talking about widening the tax bracket, then you must be thinking of um, getting the informal sector, uh, and getting the informal sector to begin to pay tax comes with a lot of um, uh, challenges. And one of those challenges is that you need to get them to the uh, put the infrastructure on for them to see that government is really care about them, and government is... Um, actually concerned about their businesses. So, uh, but I think one that we all have agreed as Nigerians and as economics, as financial analysts, everybody have agreed that um, so the subsidy regime should end. But where we are now is if the subsidy regime ends, uh, 
what are the palliatives, especially for, for the downtrodden. And I keep saying it that it's not only the downtrodden that need palliative, even the rich that are providing a job also need palliative in, in one area or the other. So it's, it's left for the incoming government to begin to tickle on that. I think, again, even with the incoming government, since they are the same government, they should put a halt to the $800 million that um, the current administration is planning to borrow to, to, to as palliative for subsidy payment. I think they should put an order to that and see and when they come in, what other strategy they will use. Right, uh, let's start off with, you know, the first concern, because the IMF, in her report, raised critical points, uh, three of them, amongst, you know, if you look at the breakdown and concern for developing economies. One which you say you agree is that to put an end to energy subsidies, uh, that's what is asking. And you're saying that, yes, you do agree. But then... Uh, if you say we need to put an end to energy subsidy, do we have, uh, have we been able to put in place, you know, prepare the entire country to uh, cushion the effect of, you know, what will happen when we remove the subsidy? Do we have refineries functioning? Uh, our refineries function? Do we have the capacity to refine our own crude? That's also on the one hand. What about the concerns of thefts that has also characterized and gulped a lot of resources? On today's you know, papers, you have reports saying that about 29 trillion, a combination of subsidy and oil theft uh, between uh, 2005 up until 2020 or 2022, has got 29 trillion naira. That's a lot to grapple with. So, so if we're saying that, yes, it's okay to put an end to subsidy, have we put our house in place to ensure that we, we have gotten to a point where we can remove subsidy? Well, when you talk about putting a house in place, um, I think it's boiled down to structures. Um, if you look at the 29 trillion you're talking about for oil theft, uh, you need to look at it this way. I think um, before now, I think we should be talking more than that. And the government came up with a strategy by giving the former military leader the opportunity to manage the uh, pipelines. And uh, since then, we've seen a reduction in terms of Theft. That shows that it, had, it was an indigenous problem, and that's why we had the Navy. Maybe the Navy were no more, they are not as indigenous as the former militants to be able to tackle this um, oil theft. Remember also we have the petroleum industry bill that also made an attack at um, tackling oil theft with incentive for every community that has a pipeline pass through the Swiss and those pipelines were not vandalized. But up to now, we've not been able to implement that because of the um, subsidy regime that we are still doing. Uh, when you talk about um, refinery being in place and um, um, what um, refinery being in place, you know, the government has no business in building refineries. I keep saying it. Um, they have a lot of refineries. You look at the Kaduna refinery, the Portaco refinery, the Warrior refinery. All those refineries are in the death stage, and I expected that the government by now should have um, sold all those refineries, especially the Portaco refinery where we had that um, the Minister for State for Petroleum there was saying that um, they are actually working, uh, making sure that at the first by January, that refinery will begin to produce a little bit of um, refined petroleum product for Nigeria. But up to now, we've not seen that. That tells you that um, there's a lot of corruption when it comes to turnaround maintenance. We've been having turnaround maintenance since the administration of uh, President Ibrahim Babangida opting now and it has not yielded the result. The only uh, president that took the bull on the the, 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 the the bull by the horn to address this this um, so-called turnaround maintenance money was uh, President Richard Gobasanjo when he decided to sell off all the refinery. Well, unfortunately, Labour and the, the incoming government of uh, President Umar Asheh Mustayar overruled that um, stairs and that is why we have the challenge. If you say, what are we going to be look? We are paying subsidy of about six trillion, and as it stands now, from the time from now, from in terms of when um, throughout last year we've had our petroleum price move to by eighty one percent. So definitely, then if you are moving the price by eighty one percent, and you are still paying subsidy, and uh, I mean where the subsidy hasn't come down, it's only in Nigeria that you keep seeing that cars keep increasing. Uh, even when there's hardship in the land, we consume more petroleum product. Even when there's hardship in the land, we've not had this, this, a, 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 a trust. Um, maybe a, a, talk, a, a system we can trust to really say this is the amount of oil consumption that we are consuming and this and that and that. So I think uh, if we were able to come up with that trust, we may not have been paying 
this much for subsidy payment like we are. And so what people are saying is that work to, if, if, if you have to remove palliative, then come up with, uh, with palliative. I mean, if you want to remove subsidy, come up with palliative that will touch everybody, especially the downtrodden. Because the first subsidy on the city one that suffer more in this um, area of where, um, uh, for a subsidy because they are the ones that still take the buses and some of these buses now are being um, moved by Tizu left center right and so definitely the, the 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 price of transportation has gone up so it's only those Nigerians that have cars the rich Nigerians that go to the uh, to filling station to buy at the 168 and also you mustn't forget that in the rural area and outside of Lagos is hardly you get fuel for 185 naira. Is selling above that way. We are above that. We're looking at about 250, 360. Even in Lagos, some filling stations up to this moment are selling for above 185 naira. Okay, so, so, so then I know that you've spoken to you know the issue or the concerns has been raised by the IMF, and it's not just the IMF. Uh, yourself and others have also believed that subsidy should be removed. But again, my question is, do you think that we have put the necessary measures in place? Are we ready to take out subsidy? Or we're just saying that there's need for us to take it out, really? I think the first thing is take it out. <laughs> <laughs> take it out. Take, then, it out. Uh, take it out. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever happens after that, you begin to re strategize because do nobody any good. So, because... Um, if, if, if you look at the increment in for petroleum price, for that, they don't consult Nigeria before they do it. They just do it, and then we, we come up looking for strategy to live with it. So take it out first. Then, but again, if we, I, I, I swear that you are taking it out. You have your strategy um, on how to address some of those um, issues that will, will, will make the cost of living high for, for Nigerians. For me, um, that is what they need to do. Hmm. So, so then again... It's my question. We already know that the government has said $800 billion uh, being borrowed from the, the World Bank as means of palliative. They're going to put it at across, you know, some Nigerians, 10,000, 10, that's exactly what's stipulated. Uh, do you think that this is actually very sustainable? Is this a sustainable strategy? And are there other strategies? So I think that you're just trying to be, you know, uh, politically correct on this one, not to just be there. But... To be very honest, again I ask, do you think that we have put in measures to cushion the effect of stopping or removing subsidy? I will come back to this question again that you just asked again. I think we have never we, we have never done that before now. Remember, uh, we have done palliative before when it comes to these issues. Remember the petroleum trust fund during the Sani Abacha regime? Whereby a certain amount was set aside, being managed by the current president, um, President Muhammadu Buhari, was he was the head of a uh, petroleum trust from PTF. And what we do then is that when we are talking about palliative, we only talk about road transports. That's the only palliative government keeps saying. And uh, we buy buses, we give buses, and at the end of the day, does these buses really meet the needs of all Nigerians? There's more about the civil servants and how many Nigerians actually civil servants. What of the informal sector? that needs to move their goods from the rural area to the urban area? What type of mass transportation are you providing for them? Even when they try to go to the Nigeria, uh, National Union of Road Transport Workers, it, 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 didn't, it didn't meet the desire. Because even with that, some of those bus packed up, those bus were not well managed. So it's insane to continue to do the same thing, and I think you have a different result. Even the current $800 million palliative, that we're, $800 million palliative that we're seeing, 5000 look, I say it. How much is five thousand? I say give you five five thousand, and the end of the year you collect sixty thousand. If you look at the the the, the, the current uh, exchange rate in terms of naira to dollar in the parallel market, that sixty thousand naira is not even up to a hundred dollars. That is one. Then secondly, if you go to the import export window of the government, which is about four hundred and sixty-two, then sixty thousand naira is roughly about one hundred and twenty twenty dollars per year. How can that really uh, help the, or, um, the, 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 the downturn, especially in the rural area? If you look at the, the report that have come from MBS, Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, it shows that inflation figure is even going higher in the rural area than in the urban area. 
And why is this? Because the cost of living in the rural area has even gone high because most of them have to transport their goods and their transportation has gone over 200% because of the cost of petroleum products in those areas. Because most of them buy this product for as high as 300 to 300 to 350 naira per liters. So when you look at that, you say, oh, are you being sincere with um, political correct about subsidy? Subsidy should go. But when we are beginning to think about subsidy, we must always think of subsidy that will touch everybody, that will make that will make economic sense. I give you an example: with Kenya, when the Kenyan president came into uh, to power, the first thing he did was to remove subsidy in petroleum product. He said he was going to do that, and then put back the subsidy in the diesel area. And what did we see in that? We saw that he was looking at look, most of our industry runs on gas which is diesel so what are we going to do we'll make sure we subsidize that area so that when we do any production the cost of production will come down and so by that so doing the, the the cost of goods and services also will come down and it's going to affect everything it's going to have a snowball Mukta, effect too. Mukta, you but, know the reason yeah. i'm asking this is it's we understand that a lot of persons have not believed you know in subsidy from the onset so you have people who don't believe that this subsidy is even really a thing that is just meant for a few and some other persons who would have described, including this government once upon a time when they were not in power, they had described subsidy as a scam. Now we're here saying we want to take out subsidy. I hope that we're all following the conversation that petrol might be selling for 750 naira per litre, 500 naira. Do we know what the implication of that means? We live in a climate where salaries have not been increased for only God knows how long. 30,000 naira minimum wage has not been implemented. There are still some state government that have not been able to pay 30,000 naira. And we know that for every other time you have the cost of petrol go up, it trickles down on every other thing that you have to buy. So I don't understand if we have, if this government and everybody that's on board or is in this boss is thinking, because if you say you're going to remove subsidy, um, say, um, in June, June is almost here. As soon as we're in May, June is here already. We just have a few more months. And we're saying, what are the... Me yes, everybody's calling remove subsidy, but what exactly have we put in place? Are we not supposed to be proactive as a people? Are we going to be reactive? Just, you know, remove subsidy and then react to whatever happens? Do we... I, well, I don't know if, we, if we're thinking about the, the, the picture. Because... If we live in the climate where we're talking about inflation on double digits, you want to agree with me, you're also talking about the fact that a lot of people are jobless. So you're talking about the fact that petrol is on the high. Now, how many businesses will continue to be sustained? How many people will continue to pay salaries? Do we know what's going to happen? We're also projecting that, you know, unemployment rates might just be hitting 41%. So do we anticipate that more people will be unemployed? After this time out, I mean, I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom here, but I'm saying, are we thinking about the effect of removing subsidy? As much as we say it's important to remove it, have we made the necessary plans to cushion the effect of this? Should we just wait and be reactive and whatever happens, then it happens? How does that make it, you know, very fair? Okay, um, I, 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 I'll come to your question of removal of subsidy. Okay. Um, if you remove subsidy... You should also know that um, if it is if it is well managed, other industry will come in. They will begin to have those jobs. I'm, I'm telling you, we've seen that happen in the in the communication sector. We will see that happen in the power sector, and we expect that to continue to happen in those sectors going forward. So definitely, we are going to see those um, challenges, the little challenges that come with the move out subsidy, like you have mentioned. Um, in terms of um, bringing down, in terms of cost of living. I'll give you an example. There's diesel subsidy has been removed from diesel for, for a very long time. And what we're seeing now, at the point, diesel was selling for 900 naira. But today, it's selling for 730 naira. That is what removal of subsidy can do because everybody market forces begin to determine it. Now, I know the challenge is that, oh, do we have the refineries working? Remember that everybody wants to invest in the refinery. Everybody wants to do that. But again, when you are being controlled um, by, by pricing, you don't want to die. By the time you open up that sector, you are going to get a lot of investment that are going to come into this country as, as, as a means of reduce, um, removal of the subsidy. So for me, removal of subsidy has a snowball effect. It has its challenges, and you, which you have rightly pointed out in terms of cost of living, especially for the ordinary Nigerian, has it really increased? Those are things that if we remove subsidy, and government is saying that some of this money from removal of subsidy, some of them will be used 
to increase the salary of um, civil servants. Some of the money from this subsidy will be used to, 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 to develop our infrastructure, especially health and education. I mean, sincere policy that we can come up and see that it is working. It will have an effect in our productivity. A situation whereby we are paying about six trillion uh, in a year for subsidy. How much is the is the total um, staff strength of the Niger Nigerian? How much does the civil servant take home? Even the political appointee, they will spend up to six trillion in a year. And again, we don't even have the statistic to even match up this, uh, this, uh, this, this is what I'm skip saying, the data to even match up this uh, uh, um, subsidy payment that really how much of this that we consume. And again, when you're talking about, oh, we have to be reactive or proactive, but you know, but well, he might change during the, the income administration that we have always been reactive, not proactive to any issues that have to do with Nigeria. It has always been a reactive type of um, situation. So for me, I think we need to, uh, uh, like you say, the income, the income administration have said that we are going to remove subsidies. We are going to, but you, if you listen to them, the language is beginning to change. They are saying, okay, when we come in, we we'll look at it. We we'll look at ingenious ways of doing it. We we'll look. There are ways. It's not rocket science. There are ways that we can do this that could be beneficial to those that need to benefit from subsidy removal. That is my point. Ghana has removed their subsidy. Ghana have removed subsidy from petroleum products. Where did Ghana do? Ghana said, okay, we start paying subsidy on energy. That is power. It's paying subsidy for every Ghanaian, a certain percentage of, of, of that is paid. And that touches everybody. And that also can be regulated. That we know how many households and how much of uh, uh, subsidy that each household is going to, going to benefit from. The UK did the same thing. They went to the energy sector during the, their meltdown and said, look, we are coming to winter and there might be a lot of it. They said, okay, each household is entitled to 2,500 for, for power costs. So those are ways to begin to say, okay, subsidy is coming, but it's going to touch everybody. Not the type of subsidy that we are operating that. The downtrodden are the ones that are suffering, suffering more, more than the rich. How many poor has two or three cars? And that's why I'm saying that even at the mover of subsidy, as the, I mean, subsidy is still there. The price of petroleum product have increased over eighty-one percent. So, and yes, the subsidy bill keep going up. So, who who is collecting subsidy? Why are we still paying high, even when we are paying subsidies? We are we are still giving some. So, it it is is an ongoing conversation, which I think that the income administration should engage the stakeholder. Engage the Nigerian Labour Congress. Engage everybody that has an uh, 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 anything to do with uh, something, and see Uta. how best yeah. way to tackle it. Now, now, just quickly now, uh, which is actually the main, you know, focus of this conversation. Talks about the external borrowing, and the IMS seem to be, you know, performing an adversary role to Nigeria. Of course, we we already know why that is the case. Um, they are saying that there's, there's need for us to increase our revenue base by focusing on increasing our tax bracket. And you have said that that's not the case. But, but I'd like you to speak to that. How can we increase our revenue base if revenue is the challenge? And also the issue of increasing the tax bracket. What does, even, what does that even mean uh, about increasing tax bracket? Well, what are you talking about increasing tax bracket? They are thinking um, um, get maybe we pay more tax. And the government knows that you can't tax more Nigerians. So if you can't tax more Nigerians, get more Nigerians into the tax bracket. And now, this administration have done well in that area. You, you agree with me that way. The tax return we've been getting has been a little bit higher comparable to other administrations. So I think that has been, they have been able to achieve that. And, and they are still working on that. Now, when you talk about um, um, the tax uh, uh, bracket, like I said, um, the sector is a former sector that pay tax. The former sector seems to be immune from payment of tax. I think that is that um, play that the IMF is telling and the IMF of the World Bank are telling Nigeria: Look, you need to see how you can engage and get tax from this point. Some states have done it, whereby every month the, the small business are tax a fixed amount of money, and this money has been collected, and then they have other incentives. Like some of them said, okay, you can go to the hospital. You can go there and you have free medicare where if you're a pregnant woman if you're a child your child is sick you can take them to the hospital this is why we are collecting this stuff so that's why i said that the government must come up with what is going to be beneficial to the informal sector if we are tax, what are the benefits that comes with this payment of tax because a lot of them are actually incurring a lot of more, more over overhead costs in the in their businesses because they have to provide power for themselves. Some of them even have to provide room for, for, for motorists to move into to 
their own location. So I think um, widening the tax bracket has a lot to do with um, looking at engineers' ways of getting the informal sector and what they are going to give back to them. For me, if we are able to achieve that, then they, they will, would have widened the tax bracket and bring in more income to government. Look, I keep saying it, the era whereby government look at tax as revenue is gone. Most government all over the world now begin to look at tax as a means of attracting investment into their countries. When this investment comes in, they are going to pay, create jobs. And from these jobs, this job, people are going to pay tax. And then the PPP, which is public-private partnership, is what is done everywhere in the world. If you are going to look at all our borrowing we're done to build infrastructure, but how much of this infrastructure can generate revenue on their own? Why are you not giving this infrastructure to, to the private sector to build and operate for, for certain numbers of years, whereby you now use your, your project as, as, as a collateral, and then instead of going all always to borrow to do projects that does not add um, it, it does not bring income, but bring, there's economic value if you look at the Lagos impact on Expressway. Mm. But if you are giving it to the private sector, then we have those road to We have government Muta, money not going in. We have to go. We have those road maintained. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we have to go, unfortunately. I've been prompted that we're out of time. Uh, we'll continue this conversation how to generate our you know, revenue base or increase our revenue base, I beg your pardon, rather than engage in more borrowings because that has always been. Uh, an option for us as long as we say there's nothing wrong in borrowing. And some other quarters would say, widen the tax margin. Let's have the elites pay taxes because some of them uh, are not paying taxes as much as they should pay. Uh, Mukta, thank you so much for being part of the, the show. <coughs> My pleasure, always. Thank you. Good morning. Right, again. We have been speaking with a financial analyst right here in Lagos, uh, Mukhtar Mohammed. He joined us via Zoom. We'll just uh, take a break when we return. We'll talk a bit of sports before we join the newsroom at 9 o'clock. Please stay with us. Good morning. <laughs>